In this episode, I'm going to give you five tips for reading the book of Leviticus. Before we jump into that, if you haven't already, please do us a big favor and click the little subscribe button and click the notifications icon. That tells YouTube, hey, we like this channel. We want to see more of it. And as always, if you appreciate the ministry here at Disciple Dojo, we don't really have a Patreon or anything like that. We just ask people that believe in what we're doing to head over to our website, DiscipleDojo.org, and donate whatever amount they're able to on a monthly basis or as a one-time gift. We are trusting that God will provide for everything we need as we continue to just equip, engage, and empower God's people through this ministry. All right, let's talk about Leviticus. Now, if you're like most people whose goal was to read through the Bible in a year, you probably did pretty good until you got to that third book of the Bible, Leviticus. Leviticus is the graveyard of one-year Bible reading plans. And at one level, I don't blame you. If you don't know what to do with this book and just start reading it like any other book, it can get pretty inscrutable. So I want to give you five tips that I think will help you navigate through this book. Now at Disciple Dojo, we spent an entire year teaching through the book of Leviticus, chapter by chapter. All of those videos are available here on the channel. They're in our playlist, Leviticus, the book Christians usually skip. So be sure to go check those out. Or if you prefer to listen in the car or while you're running or working out, it's also available on our podcast. And as you start to read this book, Here's what you need to know. Tip number one, get the big picture. It's important to understand where Leviticus falls within the Old Testament and in particular within the Torah. Leviticus comes immediately after the events of Exodus chapter 40. And when I say immediately, I mean immediately. The first word of Leviticus is actually the name of the book in Hebrew Bibles, Vayikha. And Vayikha means, and he called. That's the first word of the book. The book starts with and, meaning it's tied back directly to what just happened in the last chapter of Exodus. So we have to situate Leviticus where it falls within the Torah, and it falls right in the center. So you could summarize the book of Exodus with a general theme of God telling Israel, don't get too close. And Exodus is all about God giving Moses the instructions to build the tabernacle and to inaugurate the priesthood, which is going to then be the means by which Israel can draw near to God. And that's the theme of Leviticus. If Exodus's theme is don't get too close, Leviticus's theme is, okay, now here is how you draw near to me. So keep that in mind as you're reading what seems to be dry, boring, or just weird passages and sections about rituals and laws. The overall purpose is God giving Israel the means by which they can safely approach him. And keep in mind, in the ancient world, you did not approach the gods. They dwelled far away. They dwelled on Mount Olympus or Mount Zaphon or in the depths of the sea or somewhere else where you just had no access to them. The whole book of Leviticus is about having access to the God of the universe. This brings us to point number two. When you're reading Leviticus, note the movement. And I mean that in two ways. One, note the literary movement, how the text is structured. Some have suggested that Leviticus is structured in a way that corresponds to taking a tour of the tabernacle, literally walking around the tabernacle, outer courtyard, then going through into the tabernacle itself, and then ultimately going through into the Holy of Holies. And others have suggested actually the entire structure of Leviticus is chiastic. It all leads up to the point that is the center of the book literally and literarily, which is the ceremony of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And the whole book is structured in two parts where each corresponds on different levels. Now, Leviticus interpreters will debate how the book should best be structured, but if you're reading this book, then one of the things you need to do is read it at a big picture level. Don't get lost in the specific verses or passages until you have a broad understanding of the structure of the book. In other words, until you've read it through one, two, three, four, five times. Note that there are three main movements in the book, three blocks of material, and these three blocks of material are separated by two very short 
narrative sections. And both of those narratives have to do with someone who wasn't supposed to and who knew better transgressing boundaries that God had made clear and then paying a very steep price for it. This is structured very intentionally and it's not accidental. So pay attention to the literary overview, the literary movement of the book itself while you're reading it. Also in terms of movement, pay attention to the literal movement in the book. In other words, pay attention to who goes where. Pay attention to which direction things travel. Now, in order to do this, you have to have an understanding from Exodus of how the tabernacle itself is laid out. And that's where a good diagram in a study Bible or anything, you can Google tabernacle structure online. But once you understand how the tabernacle is laid out, then you can see how the different sacrifices, offerings, rituals, celebrations, you can see how they take place geographically. And the directions that are most important for understanding what's going on in Leviticus are the east-west and the up-down directions. You know how the tabernacle is laid out. The entrance is in the east. And as you move west, you move closer to the Holy of Holies. And this is representative of moving from earth to heaven. In other words, vertical movement. So rather than go through it in a short video like this, I want to point you to our playlist here at Disciple Dojo, where we talk all about understanding Mount Sinai in our Bible Backgrounds series. We spent all of last summer going through these types of content. Concepts. So if this interests you, be sure to check out those videos. I'll link them in the description below. But the reason that these east-west and up-down directions are important is because, as we talk about in those videos, the tabernacle is like a mini portable Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai was the mountain of God. It represented the place where humanity and God met and his cloud and his fire and the storm and the lightning and all of the stuff that covered the Mount Sinai when God came in his glory. At the end of Exodus, the glory of God, that same theophanic presence, descends upon the tabernacle and fills the tabernacle. And then Leviticus picks right up with, okay, now this is how worship and fellowship are going to be. Now that I have moved into your neighborhood. And this brings us to tip number three when it comes to reading Leviticus, and that is understanding the concept of ritual purity and the importance of shared meals. Purity and impurity in the ritual sense, in the Levitical sense, are not about sin versus righteousness as much as they're about that which symbolizes life and that which symbolizes death. Now, this is something that's really strange to a lot of people who think of purity and impurity, clean and unclean, as having to do with moral judgments. But that's not what's going on. And we talk about it in the video series on Tabernacle Backgrounds here. There are a lot of things that are ritually impure that are not immoral in the least. I mean, things like childbirth, things like menstruation, things that are natural processes that can render someone Levitically, ritually unclean. Well, it's not a moral judgment. And so that's a common misunderstanding that people have when they read Leviticus. They jump immediately to, if something's unclean, that means it's wrong, sinful, evil. And it's not that simple. In Leviticus, sin does render one unclean in a holiness sense, but not everything that renders someone unclean is also sin. So check out the video in that playlist I just mentioned specifically on the concept of clean versus unclean, because it's more than we can get into in this video. Similarly, people frequently misunderstand the concept of sacrifices, especially Christians. When we read about the sacrifices, we immediately import all of our New Testament baggage and come up with the idea that the sacrifices were a burden or a hardship. They were something that Israel just did because they had to, because they just wanted to get right with God. You read Leviticus, that's not what's going on. The sacrifices were a celebration. I mean, they involved the killing of an animal, sure, but hey, guess what? So does most Thanksgiving dinners in this country. When you sit around and celebrate Thanksgiving and carve the turkey or cut the ham, you're doing a modern equivalent in many ways of what the ancient Israelite sacrificial celebrations and festivals were about. This is a society that lived off of raising plants and animals. And their diets consisted of plants and animals. And so it's no wonder that the offerings would also consist of plants and animals. Not all the sacrifices were animal sacrifices. There were grain offerings. There were drink offerings, even alcoholic offerings. Because the sacrifices, the entire tabernacle structure and the priesthood, all of it 
was symbolic of entering into the dwelling of God and having a communal meal in the presence of the king of the universe. So we have to do the best we can, especially those of us who are Christians, of distancing ourselves from thinking of the sacrifices as something that the people didn't look forward to, that was drudgery, because that wasn't the case. Being able to share a meal with someone was one of the most intimate forms of fellowship and community that you could experience in the ancient world. These rituals, these sacrifices, these festivals, even these laws, they were seen as the great king telling his people, hey, you don't have to guess. You don't have to dream. You don't have to seek omens. Here's what I want from you. And for people in the ancient world, that was unbelievably liberating because all the other gods surrounding Israel, if you read the text from other ancient cultures, you can't imagine the links people would go to to try to discern the will of the gods. I mean, read the Iliad or the Odyssey sometime. I've read the Iliad a couple of months ago. I'm in the Odyssey right now, and I am just constantly reminded of how inscrutable the will and the actions and the desires of the gods were to the ancient Greeks. And if you read the Egyptian literature, it's the same thing. If you read the Canaanite literature, it's the same thing, the Babylonian literature. And that's why in those cultures, there developed this secret esoteric class of priests, of magicians, of wise men that you would go to who had secret knowledge passed on, not available to everyone else, that you could pay them and they would reveal some of it to you if your offering was deemed acceptable. Well, this brings us to point number four about interpreting Leviticus. Leviticus is not written to the Levites. Now, this is something I actually taught for many years. The name Leviticus is a Latinized version of the tribe of Levi. And so it's just assumed, because the Septuagint translators named the book Leviticon, Leviticus, it's just assumed by so many Christians that, oh, this is a book for the Levites. But verse two of Leviticus makes it very clear. God tells Moses, hey, Tell this to all of the Israelites, literally the sons of Israel. Leviticus is written to the Israelites, all of them, not just to the tribe of Levi or within the tribe of Levi, even the priests themselves. There's no secret knowledge among the priesthoods, this esoteric ritual incantations that only the priest can know and the average unwashed masses are not allowed to know or comprehend. No, 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 that's not the case at all. God lays out everything for everyone. So everyone knows what everyone's supposed to be doing. And this is why the rituals that the priests were supposed to perform, the instructions, even the laws that the priests had to obey, this is why they are written in Leviticus. Everyone would know what the job description was for the priests. And everyone would be able to grasp the principles contained in those laws and instructions and live those principles out in their own lives. Because a major theme in Leviticus is all of Israel is to be holy. Remember in Exodus, right when God gave Israel the Ten Commandments, he said, if you obey these commandments, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And so Leviticus doesn't just give us how Israel's priests stayed holy, although it does give that, it gives us how all of Israel was to stay holy. And not just ritually, although it does have lots of that, but at the heart of the book is the holiness code. And the holiness code is about how Israel is to live in community. And the holiness code touches upon everything from sexual relationships to business relationships to treatment of foreigners. You know, when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he quoted the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he said, and the second one, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, Jesus didn't make that up. He was pulling that right from Leviticus 19, from the holiness code. And so part of appreciating and understanding the book of Leviticus as you're reading it is realizing that in God's eyes, there's no such thing as a divide between what is spiritual and what is unspiritual. Every aspect of life in Israel was touched upon by God's holiness, from how they dressed to how they planted their crops, to how they washed their utensils, to how they washed their bodies, even down to the food that they ate. Because it wasn't just that the tabernacle was to be an object lesson, although it was. All of Israel, the nation of Israel, was to be an object lesson to the surrounding peoples. Because the entire point of God calling Israel out, dwelling in their midst, 
giving them a system by which they could live as his people in covenant. All of that was for the purpose of fulfilling the Abrahamic promise that through Abraham's offspring, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. This continues after Jesus inaugurates the new covenant, after the Holy Spirit is poured out upon God's people, and they're sent out into the world with the gospel, it's still the same mission. They are still called to be God's holy people. In fact, this is what Peter tells first century Christians when he writes to them in 1 Peter chapter 1. In verse 15, he quotes Leviticus, grounding the call of God's people to be holy as God is holy. And he's talking to God's new covenant people, mostly Gentiles, but he's applying Levitical tabernacle Old Covenant terminology to them, because it's still the same mission. By living as holy people in the midst of the unholy nations, Jesus' followers are doing what Israel was called to do under the Mosaic Covenant. So the more we understand this priestly, tabernacle, sacrificial, holiness, cleanliness, ritual imagery that we read in Leviticus, the more saturated we are with it, the more familiar it becomes, rather than something that's weird and foreign and alien, the more we will see that that reflected when we turn the page to the New Testament. It's like watching your favorite movie all your life on a little black and white TV. It's all you've ever known. You have you grew up watching it. You love it. It's, it's the only way you've ever experienced this movie. And then somebody saying, hey, come over here and watch this on Blu-ray in high definition. And they play the same movie. It would almost be like a completely different experience. Same movie, same plot. You know what's happening but you see things that you never noticed before because it's in higher definition. Well, that's what it's like when you read these books in the Old Testament that so many people skip over. When you take them in, when they become as familiar to you as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, your understanding of the New Testament, of the gospel, goes from old black and white to high definition. And I can't overemphasize how much of a difference it makes. But it's not easy. And this brings us to point number five, get good resources. Now, if you're going to read Leviticus, let me give you some things that may help. I've already mentioned our walkthrough of the entire book that we have here at Disciple Dojo, as well as on our podcast. So definitely start there. But you also need to read the book. There's just no way around it. You need to read it, preferably in long sections at a time, not a couple of verses a day or just one chapter a day, but sitting down and reading it to see the movement. One of the ways you can do that is through using my favorite digital Bible study method. I have a video here on the channel explaining how to do it, but all you need is an internet connection and access to a word processor. Now I explain it more in the video, but one of the best ways for you to understand and appreciate the flow of a book is for you to go through and lay it out in its different sections. Even if how you structure it isn't exactly correct, the amount of familiarity you will have with the text is incredible. Then, as you're interacting with other resources, with other commentaries or study Bible notes, you will already have a level of proficiency that lets you appreciate the arguments and the points that they're making. So I absolutely recommend read the book. I would say read it through in a couple of different translations. And if you want to understand it even more, follow our digital Bible study method. That in and of itself will give you so much insight. But it won't be enough because there are some things in Leviticus that no amount of structural analysis will make sense of. You're going to need some experts. And so I'm going to give you some basic, some intermediate, and some advanced resources. Basic resource I recommend is is this commentary in the Mentor Commentary series by Robert Vasholz. I don't know if I'm saying his name right. Vasholz, Vasholz. This is an easy to read commentary. It's not technical. You don't have to know Hebrew. It walks you through the book. He makes some great points throughout. For a more intermediate engagement with the text, in the New Interpreter's Bible, this is a series of commentaries, and each volume contains commentaries on a number of books. Well, this volume, Volume 1 contains a commentary on Leviticus. It's here in the back of the book, and it's by Walter Kaiser. I've mentioned before here on the channel that Walt Kaiser was one of my professors back in seminary, and he's an excellent Old Testament scholar. The New Interpreter's Bible also gives the NIV and the NRSV together in parallel columns, and the commentators take both of those translations into account as they're talking about the text. But it is a little more intermediate. You will find occasional references to some Hebrew words, so just keep that in mind. Now, I'm going to be honest, I don't love this commentary series as a whole, the New Interpreter's Bible, 
but some of the volumes in it, like what Kaiser Leviticus or Romans by N.T. Wright, there are some great volumes in this set. So for that reason, it's definitely worth checking out. Then at a bigger picture level, probably the best book I read in 2022, and I'm not exaggerating, I would put this at the top of the list of all the books I read last year, L. Michael Morales, Who Shall Ascend the Mountain of the Lord, A Biblical Theology of the Book of Leviticus. This book absolutely crushes it. It's a little more intermediate. It assumes you have some familiarity with the book and with the rest of scripture and biblical theology in general. So it's not written for an absolute white belt when it comes to Bible interpretation. This would be like upper level blue belt, purple belt, but it is wonderful. I probably went through two whole highlighter pens in reading this book. He does the best job of any commentator I've ever read in giving the overall theology of Leviticus and explaining the purpose and the thrust of the book theologically, literarily, even down to the structure of the book and how it falls within the Torah, and then placing that within the overall narrative of the entire Bible. I really, I could do a whole video just on how good this book is. It's that good. Now, in terms of black belt level interpretation. I mean, those of you that are you're either in seminary, you're Bible teachers, or you're just really hardcore Bible nerds that want to know as much as you can about Leviticus, there are a couple of resources that you just need to know about. They will make a difference in how you read the book. The first one is Leviticus as a Literature by Mary Douglas. Now, Douglas is interesting because she's not a biblical scholar. She's an anthropologist. And so she approaches Leviticus through the lens of cultural anthropology, particularly having to do with purity, impurity, clean, unclean in various cultures around the world. Biblical scholars criticize her for a number of points, and a lot of those criticisms are valid. However, she forces a close reading of the text, and she illuminates things that sometimes scholars have overlooked or have either not appreciated because they are not as familiar with anthropology and concepts of purity and cleanliness, ritual taboo, things like that, that anthropologists deal with all the time. She's written a few things, but in particular, this volume, Leviticus's Literature, really explores the text itself. She lays out why she thinks the book is structured around taking a tour of the tabernacle in its different sections. And whether you end up agreeing or disagreeing with her, you're going to learn a lot on the way. And that brings us to the final name that you absolutely need to know if you're going to read the book of Leviticus, and that is Jewish scholar Jacob Milgram. Now, this is a condensed version of his three-volume set in Yale Anchor Bible series. That one's super expensive. If you have access to it, use that one. But if you don't have access to Yale Anchor Bible, then this condensed version in the Continental Commentary series gives you the gist of his arguments. Milgram has done more work than probably anyone on the book of Leviticus, and his insights on things like the food laws, the concepts of clean and unclean, placing the book within its ancient setting, how Jewish law and tradition have come to bear on it or have developed from it. All of these things are things that most Christians honestly just aren't familiar with. And that's a shame. So those are my recommendations for resources on Leviticus. There are many other good ones out there. If I didn't name one, it's not because I don't think it's good. It's because I just wanted to name a few to get people started. The bibliographies in each of those resources are enough to keep anyone busy for years studying this book. But at the end of the day, Leviticus is an important book. The New Testament authors knew Leviticus. Jesus knew Leviticus. The early readers of Scripture, even if they were Gentile from reading the Septuagint, they knew Leviticus. It's we modern Christians who don't really know Leviticus. So here at Disciple Dojo, we want to challenge you. Know Leviticus. Don't be scared of it. Understanding how to approach it goes a long way in demystifying and de-weirding the book and helping it make sense within the overall story of Scripture. So I hope this video is helpful. If it is, let me know in the comments below. Share it with other people. If you were to make a video on tips for reading Leviticus, what would your tips be? Feel free to leave those or any other comments in the comment section below. As always, thank you so much for watching. Special thank you to those of you who have subscribed and clicked the notifications icon. I think my analytics tells me it's like 15%. Stay tuned for more Black Belt Bible reading tips here at Disciple Dojo. And as always, whether it's on the mats or whether it's in the pages, keep training. Never stop being a student. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.